Bom, gente, muito obrigado mais uma vez por participar de mais um Caminho Sem Dor. Hoje um dia especial, a gente recebe pela primeira vez a doutora Andréia Tresco. A doutora Andréia Tresco é uma pessoa que caminha junto com a história da dor no Brasil, né, Charles? Tanto que ela ajudou no desenvolvimento de vários colegas e esses colegas ajudaram outros colegas a desenvolver. Então ela está aí no coração da construção de tudo que a gente pensa em dor, e, e, coincidentemente, né, Chance, no, ela está no carro, percorrendo esse caminho da construção da medicina da dor junto com a gente. E o nosso outro palestrante, Dr. Charles Oliveira, médico anestesiologista, um dos pioneiros da medicina intervencionista da dor no Brasil. Né? Ele com o Fabrício foram os primeiros FIPs do Brasil e é hoje ele o nosso anfitrião aqui no Caminho Sem Dor. Professor Charles, passa você a palavra. É uma honra ter aqui você, no, ter você novamente aqui no Caminho Sem Dor. Eu queria que você aproveitasse esses 10 minutos que a gente sempre faz previamente antes de começar a aula e falasse também sobre o projeto Expedicionários, que faz parte do grande projeto Caminho Sem Dor, que a gente leva aí tratamento para o Brasil inteiro. Dentro desse projeto que, dos Expedicionários que o professor Charles fez em João Pessoa pela primeira vez, outros virão. Esse ano, eu já falo com muita alegria que no, no, nos projetos, nas aulas, nos cursos do Simpen, nós já tratamos gratuitamente mais de 400 pacientes e com mais de 2 milhões de reais em doação de produtos médicos hospitalares, honorários médicos e tudo mais. Então, a gente conseguiu levar tratamento a 400 pacientes totalmente gratuitos, pacientes que não teriam acesso a nenhum tipo de tratamento, e principalmente tratamentos caros, intervencionista dor. É algo que nos movimenta, é algo que nos alegra muito dentro do caminho sem dor e dentro do Simpen. Seja bem-vindo, professor Charles, a palavra é sua. Carlos, obrigado pelo convite. É, também quero agradecer aqui publicamente a presença da Bruna. A gente passa dos 50 anos, a gente sempre tem que ter uma assistência técnica, né? tecnológica, aqui do lado. Obrigado. A Bruna precisava ir embora. Eu falei, não, Bruna, fica mais um pouquinho. Não, eu estou com fome, vamos pedir pizza. Então, a gente organiza dessa forma. E obrigado, Bruno, por você estar aqui me ajudando. É, eu queria contar uma história, como começou a, a, os cursos aqui no Singular. Talvez muita, muitas das pessoas não saibam que em 2009, é, eu e o Fabrício aqui no Singular, o Fabrício teve esse insight de fazer um curso tipo um, um MBA, um MBA de dor e de intervenções, sabendo que a maioria das pessoas não poderiam fazer um, uma residência regular, um fellowship regular, como a gente já tinha. A gente tinha começado o nosso fellow em 2009, a nossa primeira fellow foi a Karina Sub, e daí surgiu a ideia de fazer esses cursos modulares. Naquela, naquela época, a gente tinha um relacionamento muito estreito com a Universidade de Washington, onde o Alex Carrana era o chefe. E dentro da Universidade de Washington, era um, uma trinca muito forte, né? Alex Carrana na direção, lembrando que o Alex Carrana substituiu o... o primeiro era o, o Bônica, depois veio o John Losser, o John Losser tinha sido, é, já tinha sido aposentado. Quando eu fiz a minha prova do FIP, foi o John Losser que me examinou e um, do, um dos examinadores, e aí ele tinha se aposentado e entrou, então, a, a, o Alex Carrana. O Alex Carrana convidou o Michael Goldfield e convidou a Andrea. E aí estavam lá, né, tipo, seis meses rolando a residência, eu acho que tinha tudo para dar certo, e as coisas começaram a dar errado, dar errado de relacionamento entre essa... essa trinca aí de pessoas. E o Fabrício foi lá fazer o convite ou assinar oficialmente um apoio da Universidade de Washington. Essa conversa foi com o com Andréia primeiro. Andréia é muito triste. Ela falou, olha, eu estou saindo aqui, as coisas não estão boas e eu estou saindo e vou tocar minha vida. Ela tinha saído da, da Flórida e tinha mudado para lá. E dali ela foi para o Alasca e continuou na Flórida, nessa 
nessa vizinhança perto aí, né? Flórida e Alasca, vocês imaginam. E aí o Golfo conversou com o Fabrício e falou, olha, ou a Universidade de Washington ou a Andrea. Não tem jeito de ter dois. E aí é, o tempo mostrou que a nossa escolha foi muito correta, né? Pouco tempo depois, o, o Carrana não estava mais na Universidade de Washington. É, o Michael Goldfield é um, é um cara muito gentil, muito amável e de muito, amplo conhecimento. Mas a Andrea tem essa, essa capacidade dela de... de ela, ela é uma verdadeira é, giver, né? Ao invés de taker, ela é giver. Ela entrega para todo mundo, todo conhecimento. E conhecimento é algo que, quanto mais você divide, mais você recebe. É isso que eu aprendo aqui no meu dia a dia com meus fellows. Quanto mais ensino a eles, mais eles me ensinam. E, e é isso. É, em relação a... Quanto tempo? Horas aí, só para regular aqui meu tempo. Tem mais dois minutos. Então, o objetivo hoje é... A gente gravou essa aula tem uma hora, então uma hora atrás. André está lá em Budapeste hoje e já era meia-noite quando terminou a gravação, né? E então a gente gravou uma aula que uma hora atrás a gente estava tava aqui é, gravando isso aí. Só lá pelo sexto, sete minutos, é uma impressão minha, não sei. Deu uma falhadinha no, na, na internet, mas logo, logo estabilizou e as coisas correram de uma forma muito tranquila. Ela dividiu a aula em duas partes. Ela pegou aqui, a primeira parte falou de crioterapia e a segunda parte ela falou sobre estimação de nervos periféricos. A gente vai ter um... um isso aqui é um esquenta né, do, do, do workshop que a gente vai ter aqui dia 24, e vai ser fantástico. A gente está começando disto com quem tem a maior experiência que eu conheço, né? De, ela fala de crioterapia há mais de 20 anos. Então, não é uma coisa nova para ela, ela tem uma experiência muito grande, a gente tem uma experiência muito boa, mas não se compara a dela, em questão de de tempo, né? E também essa nova tecnologia que é a estimação desses periféricos há vários no mercado internacional e o primeiro que está chegando aqui no Brasil é esse Wave. Então é uma grande oportunidade para a gente é, caminhar com este trabalho aí que a gente é, tem muito que entregar para os nossos pacientes. É um produto a mais, um, são diferenciais a mais, coisas que você pode colocar rapidamente em, no dia a dia dos seus pacientes, principalmente a crioterapia, que não é uma coisa que não tem nenhum device. E uh, o estimulador é algo muito factível na vida também do anestesiologista que não tem as habilidades cirúrgicas que um um neurocirurgião ou um ortopedista de coluna tem. Então é isso, Carlos. Vamos dar o play, porque daqui a pouco vai cestar, né? Então, toca o play aí, Carlão. Eu sei que tem que dar o play aí, não é? Olá, hoje é dia 20... Dia 14. 14, perdão, 14 de junho e o doutor André, que é a nossa convidada, está hoje lá em Budapeste e a gente vê que o dia está longo, lá já são 23 horas e 9 minutos, então a gente vai gravar essa aula aqui agora e vamos passar daqui a duas horas. O objetivo é é fazer uma preparação do evento que a gente vai ter neste, na semana que vem aqui no Brasil. A doutora André é uma das protagonistas, onde nós teremos um cadáver workshop dia 24 que vai envolver essas duas técnicas. 
doutora Andréa, ela domina amplamente ambas, né? tanto a crioterapia quanto a, a estimulação de nervos periféricos, e ela é a diretora-chefe do Steamwave, e ela vai poder compartilhar não só a experiência dela com o Steamwave, mas como outras técnicas, e é uma ótima possibilidade no arsenal médico, do, do médico de dor intervencionista no dia de hoje. Dr. Andra, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be with us. I know today you had a very big day, a huge day, working day in PSI in Budapest. And so we are waiting you here. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's always good to see my Brazilian friends. I always feel at home in Brazil. So I appreciate very much the invitation. So we're going to talk about two topics. And in some ways, they so, sort of overlap because they are involving sometimes the same nerves, two different approaches to nerve pains, um, two very different approaches to nerve pain, but sometimes with the same target. So there's a little bit of overlap, but I think you'll see where these, tar where these techniques may fit in in your own practice. So as I share my screen, we will start with cryo and the So if I can get that to fit in here, there we go. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about cryo and the past, present, and the future and its role in uh, pain management interventions. Now, I'm a lot of pasts of many things. I was in private practice, then I was in academics, as professor at the University of Washington, director of the Pain Fellowship Program at the University of Washington and the University of Florida, past president of the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians and of the Florida and Alaska Societies. And as Charles said, I'm the chief medical officer of Stemwave Technologies, which for this lecture has no um, impact. So when we talk about the history of cryo, we know that in 1777, a long time ago, John Hunter, who was a surgeon, described that cold with ice would destroy tissue in a rooster comb, that red part that's on the top of a rooster. But he noticed that there'd be good healing and no scarring. And then in 1919, Trendelenburg noted that freezing caused damage to nerves with a prolonged loss of function, but eventually healing again without scarring. In 1961, Cooper developed the first cryoprobe. So we're talking about a technology that's almost 40 years old. And in 1976, Lloyd coined the term cryoanalgesia. And in general, all of the cryo systems look at using a compressed gas, usually carbon dioxide or nitrous, that inside the probe goes, op goes out through a tiny op aperture and expands. And when a gas expands, that drops the temperature and makes the tip go down to about minus 70 degrees C. And it's called a Joules-Thompson effect. And when that happens, it creates an ice ball. And the size of the ice ball is a function of the size of the probe and the characteristics of the probe itself. But this can be a very significant sized lesion, which as we know now, sometimes bigger is better. That's what they told me for years. The biggest advantage of cryo over other technologies like phenol or alcohol or RF is it going to be used on large myelinated nerves? There's no neuroma formation. So when the nerve is growing back, it still has its insulation, its myelin sheath to grow back down. And that means this can be repeated multiple times and this nerve will still grow back normally. And so just as an example, this is untreated nerve tissue. And this is one week after treatment. You see all the granular cells coming in here, but the myelin sheath has stayed intact. So this is what we call Wallerian degeneration, and that nerve will degenerate, but even though it's degenerating, this PVC piping that the nerve can grow back down still stays intact. And this was some immunofluorescent studies done on mice where this is what a normal nerve would look like. So green would be the neuron, lots of neurons here. And so then one week after cryo, all the nerves are gone, all the neurons are gone, but 32 weeks after multiple refreezings, here you see 
structure looks identical to what it did. And so that's what makes it unique is the idea that this nerve regenerates. So you say, well, goodness, if it regenerates, the pain comes back, but not usually because it, because the nerve is usually with the ones that we're treating are entrapped. Once the nerve dies, once it's killed, then that entrapment stops. All the spasm stops, all the pain stops, all the pain behaviors and the change in gait and all the things, the edema, everything that was perpetuating this entrapment stops. Everything goes back to normal. And now the nerve is growing back into a normal environment. It doesn't affect the muscles, the blood vessels or the fat. And most of these machines have a built-in nerve stimulator. So you can do both sensory and motor stimulation be right on the nerve and they monitor gas flows and there's a defrost cycle. And that defrost cycle is important because as that ice ball forms, it's freezing from the inside, the temperature on the outside now after a while doesn't get any colder because the ice is actually insulating the ice ball from the cold surface. This is, I grew up, I was living in Alaska for the last seven years. And in Alaska, we big build houses out of ice igloos, right? Well, not really, we don't do that, but ice is a wonderful insulator. And so what you do is after a certain period of time, usually about one to two minutes, that ice ball doesn't get any bigger. And so you stop the freezing, let the tissues defrost, but before they get warm again, you refreeze. And now the tissues are cold, super cool, and you make an even bigger ice ball. And so that freeze to frost is important. There are some other tools that have been developed. Um, this one from Atricure was designed to be used intraoperatively. Here's the inside of the lung and you lay this probe right on the um, intercostal nerve. And they've been doing this now. Who have pectus esca, we have the bin. And so they hear from having I no opioids because of the pain relief. And then a handheld device that um, has a, a um, nitrous oxide capsule in here. And so the nitrous oxide goes through either little tiny um, probes or one, three tiny ones called a trident or a longer one. So when we start talking about targets, we have the superorbital nerve. And those of y'all who are paying attention, if you'll feel over your eyebrow, you'll feel a little um, notch right in the notch of the skull. And that's the superorbital notch. And the superorbital nerve goes through that. And it will get entrapped. Usually it's a notch, but sometimes it'll actually have a ligament and a calcification. And this now becomes a foramen. And that foramen, as things swell, gets really tight and you can't pull the nerve off. So perimenstrually, when women are holding on to fluid, you'll get this nerve getting entrapped and they'll get these throbbing headaches because there's a blood vessel that goes with it. You can be injured by poorly fitting glasses, frowning, squinting, and this is the nerve that gets better when you give Botox. Um, the exam, you can say you can feel it, um, you can inject it. I do recommend that you move that eyebrow up out of the way so you're injecting a little bit lower than what I've shown here. So you don't wanna inject in the eyebrow because it'll cause alopecia. The, and then this is the freezing. The infraorbital, same sort of thing, runs right here. There's a little notch right on, there's a little foramen here. And facial trauma, intraoral or extraoral, um, the physical exam, the injection, either extraoral or you can inject intraorally as well, and freezing. And then the auricular temporal nerve. This is a third division nerve coming up through the temple, runs through the temporalis muscle and next to the temporal artery. And so this is what gets misdiagnosed as TMJ. And at four o'clock in the morning, this is the headache that'll wake you up because you'll start clenching. And so here we see the physical exam, making an equilateral triangle and the injection and the freezing. Now you wouldn't normally use fluoro, but just to show you where this probe would be if you did do it under x-ray. A trigeminal at the foramen ovale, you see the probe coming right in for the trigeminal nerve. And this is very effective for tic de la rue, facial pain and facial cancers. But you always want to look at the distal sites first 
So I look distally before I ever move proximally. Occipital for headaches, um, the greater lesser in third, it can refer to the frontal or behind the eyes area. And you may need to, though usually we look at treating them at the base of the skull, sometimes you need to treat them more proximally. And so here you see the physical exam, that's the occipital prominence or the union, the foramen magnum, you put your middle finger where you don't wanna be in that foramen magnum, index finger goes on the conjoined tendon, and then you bring your thumb up just lateral to the conjoined tendon, and you'll feel a groove running vertically here, and you rub across that, and it'll trigger a headache. The landmark guided injection and the landmark and the cryo. Now, I told you there was a proximal entrapment. So this comes out from C2, comes across the inferior oblique. And so you can see this nerve under ultrasound as it crosses over the inferior oblique and before it joins with the occipital artery. And so under ultrasound, placing your probe, first finding that bifid um, spinous process and then placing your probe at um, the transverse process of C1, then you get to see the inferior oblique as a straight line. You can actually see the ice ball right on top of the nerve. And here's your vertebral artery way out of the way. And so then intercostal neuralgia, uh, neuralgia, I told you it could be used for post-op pain as well as post hepatic neuralgia, fractured ribs. And I'm recommending an oblique approach rather than what we've been taught, which is to go um, perpendicular to the, to the rib and then drop off. Well, the nerve is actually up underneath this edge. So when you're doing this technique, you're trying to get into the potential space but it's hard to have contact with the nerve that way. Plus it's a 12 gauge angiocath that you're putting into the lung. So instead, what I recommend is coming over the inferior border of the rib, parallel with the rib and then sliding under. And that gives you a lower risk of pneumothorax. So instead of going perpendicular to the rib, what I recommend is coming parallel or obliquely to the rib. And that you can do these injections under ultrasound where you'll see the rib, the pleura, the lung, and the direction of the needle. And here's the probe on its oblique approach coming cephalad, being called ed cephalad, coming up underneath the edge of the rib. You can look at the ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric, and the anterior or abdominal cutaneous nerves. And these can mimic appendicitis, diverticulitis, gallbladder problems, where the nerve gets entrapped as it comes across the abdomen and into the rectus abdominis. And then if you look at the ilioinguinal iliohypogastric, which are not intercostal nerves, but they're L1 and L2, this will, these will get traumatized with fan and steel incisions and hernia repairs. And so here you see the nerves coming in, piercing through this fascia, which I've taken off here, and you see the vessel traveling with the nerve physical exam, you can actually feel these little half moon defects. So tonight when you go to bed, when you just feel along the edge of your abdomen and you'll feel little defects, um, usually three or four of them as having to do with each of those six packs of muscle. And so landmark guided injection here at the edge of the rectus, um, you can see it under ultrasound, the rectus gets very narrow here. And then you have the cryoprobe and then a shadow of the cryoprobe right over the, those nerves. Pudental nerve is the most, um, probably the, the most torturous nerve that we have. Um, and it treats uh, perineal, perirectal, vaginal, scrotal, coccydinia. And you can do either an anterior or a posterior or an intervaginal approach. And because it breaks into individual branches, you can actually address the individual branch you want to, and avoid some of the undesired effects. So those nerves all come together at the, anterior, at the uh, ischial spine. So to do here, your spine is normally hidden because it's superimposed on the, um, on the pelvis. By, with an ipsilateral oblique, you start to see the, this um, ischial spine and the nerve lies right at the tip of the ischial spine. Um, you can see it here using a peripheral nerve stimulator. And then the main entrapment is as it travels 
underneath the sacred tuberous, over the sacred spinatus, over the obturator internus, and then down through Alcox Canal, where it then spreads. And so here you see a patient with radium seeds, two hip replacements, perineal pain, and that's where we were freezing the nerve here. Ganglion of impar, my, my buddy Eleni has developed this technique of going right through the sacrococcygeal ligament and freezing the ganglion on the other side. We can do cryofacets, and I particularly like to do this where I'm trying not to get a, a, a Charcot joint, a completely denervated joint. And so the cryo is a larger lesion, so you get um, the nerve better, but it also is going to regenerate faster so that you're not having problems with the innervation of the multifidus. So this is what I like to do for those young, healthy backs. It gives them that period of rehab before they need to, before the, the nerves grow back. And here you see the cryoprobe um, at, S1, at L5 S1. And you make, that means you can actually even go into the dorsal root ganglion and reliably freeze the dorsal root ganglion knowing that even if you get motor weakness within three months, guaranteed the motor weakness will come back. And so I do the diagnostic injection to see those patients, to see if they have better function with the nerve frozen than with the nerve numb than they did without the nerve numb. And that's the, the key. If they've got better function without the pain, then uh, it's, they're a candidate for this technique. And here you see the cryoprobe in the foramen, just inside the foramen. Superior clunial nerve is uh, comes from L1, 2, and 3, but we now know has interventions from, I mean, uh, innervations from uh, L4 and L5. The most medial nerves are the ones that are going to be Entrapped, there can be up to five of them here. And the most medial ones go through a canal and it will refer, since it's coming from the lumbar spine, it will refer pain all the way down the back of the leg to the foot and, and becomes one of what we call a pseudo sciatica, a pain that, that mimics a herniated disc but is not due to a herniated disc. And so here you see the nerves going through the their um, say through their tunnels, and you see the innervations not just from T12 and L1, which is what we were classically taught, but also from L2, L3, L4, and L5. And the ones that are most medial are the most ones most likely to be entrapped. And the cryoprobe right on the top of the iliac crest. Now the middle clunial nerve is the inner main innervator of the sacroiliac joint, and so when you're doing your diagnostic. Uh, sacroiliac joint injections, watch where the dye goes. These nerves are piercing the joint capsule and the dye will track back along them. You notice that these nerves all gather right here and this structure right here is the PSIS. Why does the PSIS hurt in sacroiliac problems? Well, it hurts because it's right where the all those nerves gather together. And so here you see cryo of the um, of the middle clunial nerve. And then you can denervate the hip joint at the, um, the articular branch of the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve. And here you see a total knee, a total hip replacement and freezing the nerves going to it because it was still painful. Infrapatellar savinus, very, very common cause of knee pain. Um, and just about this is the time the patients can't localize where it hurts, occasionally refers to the medial calf and can present as a CRPS. And this is um, an article I wrote on the IPS. And here's the nerve coming around. Under ultrasound, you'll usually find it in the flare, but occasionally it'll be outside of that, which would be one of the reasons why fluoroscopy RF will fail and cryoneuroblation of that nerve. And so um, I really don't like the term genicular nerves, but it's currently being um, used widely. And so just like the radio frequency, the probes can be placed in exactly, the, the cryoprobe can be placed in exactly the same place. And then you can go all the way down to the foot to the digital nerves that get trapped at the ball of the foot and diabetics and poorly fitting shoes and um, the deep perineal nerve as well. And so this becomes a potential treatment for peripheral neuropathy. And here you see cryo of the digital nerves. So some just, you know, looking at it using for acute pain management, um, could it replace continuous peripher peripheral infusions, the use for lateral femoral cutaneous cryo to measure out 
I mean, to anesthetize an area long-term for a skin graft, for a burn. Um, the looking at um, percutaneous intercostals for the pain after mastectomy, um, the phrenic nerve to, to limit the movement of the diaphragm when there is a lung resection, so you don't get uh, edema after the lung resection, and even cryo for tumors. And actually even looking at a vagotomy for hunger with cryo because the nerve will regenerate. So they've had been advances because when the nerve regrows, the function returns to normal, usually without the pain, it can be repeated. It provides that window of opportunity for painless rehab, uses the same neurolytic codes as radio frequency does, which is a destruction by thermal or chemical means, and it's an office procedure. Um, Cryoneural ablation is resurging because of a combination of new recognition of peripheral nerve pathology, new imaging techniques like ultrasound, and new equipment. And it's the treatment of choice for um, nerves that are entrapped or large myelinated nerves that are entrapped. So nice little book here um, on peripheral nerve ultrasound. I don't get any royalties for this. It's about 90 pages. And, but this is the book that I wrote, 900 pages. And uh, I also don't get any royalties from this. So those of you who will email me directly, um, I'm happy to, to provide a link to my personal copy of the book. And so I thank you for listening. And we've talked about the power of ice. Muito bem, André. É, fantástica aula como todas. E cada vez que eu vejo essas aulas, eu aprendo mais e mais. I know you understand Portuguese very well, so this is why I'm speaking Portuguese. André, uh, we have a couple of questions, and uh, a primeira pergunta é se tem algum estudo comparando um head-to-head -head de crio e rádio frequência nos nervos geniculares. Is there a head-to-head -head study comparing cryo and radio frequency? And uh, if we don't have, how is, it, is your experience with cryo in knee arthrosis? Okay. Um, one of the things I love doing is for knees and shoulders is to do the cryo preoperatively for postoperative analgesia knowing that the nerves will grow back and you're not leaving the, jo the joint completely denervated, which would be a Charcot joint, which would not be a good thing. And so um, there have not been any head-to-head -head treatments, I mean, head-to-head -head studies. Um, I've done both. I actually have a lecture I call Fire and Ice, comparing the, the two techniques. But um, the thing that I use radio frequency for, um, facets, but I lay it across the, the capsule to try and tighten down the capsule. I use it for sacroiliac joint capsules. I use radio frequency for um, enthesthopathies that, that, because it denervates the periosteum and uh, kills the little vaso, um, the neovascularization that's causing the periosteal pain. Um, and then I do cryo for large myelinated nerves. So I see them as hammers and screwdrivers. There are times when, a, when you could use either, but there are times when a hammer is more appropriate and times when a screwdriver is more appropriate. Uh, and how long do you think it works for the knee? Six months, less than this, more than this? Well, it depends again. So when the, if, when the nerve grows back into a normal, if the nerve grows back into a normal environment, then when the nerve grows back, it's no longer entrapped. If you've been able to do the rehab to get better, when the nerve grows back, it grows back without the pain because there isn't any pain there. So it's really hard to tell if you don't get a good freeze, if you get close to the nerve, but you don't kill it, then you'll have um, the sensation returning back in just a, a few days or a week or so. That's an inadequate freeze. That's a technically poorly done cryo done appropriately um, motor function. So I have done, like I did um, a female physician who had not trigeminal neuralgia, but rather a facial neuralgia, facial nerve neuralgia. And so I froze the facial nerve, gave her a full motor, full paresis of the facial nerve, you know, the whole bit. 
three months and one day, nerves of the full function had returned, pain never did. And so, um, so I've, I've followed patients for 20 years without a return in pain. I've had others that the pain returns because of the structure, like post, post laminectomy patients have all the scarring, the nerve hits the scar again, and you're back to where you were. And I'll freeze those about once every year or so. So, Eu não, eu não sei se você concorda comigo, mas nem sempre a gente consegue com a radiofrequência ter os bons resultados que o bloqueio diagnóstico tem nos joelhos, porque a lesão é muito pequena em relação ao anestésico local. E a CRIO, por ter, ser uma lesão maior, talvez ela tenha melhores res, resultados. I'm talking in, in português that when we do diagnostic block with local anesthetic, we have better results than when we do the radio frequency. Maybe because the lesion is smaller than the, the spread of the local anesthetic. And the cryo could be a good solution because the lesion, it, it's, it's huge, no? I don't know if you agree with me or not. And, uh, I do. I there's confusion about a cooled RF and cryo. It's completely They're different. very, very different. Cooled RF is heat. It is just in a water bath. So anybody who's ever made a hollandaise sauce, you know you're trying to melt the butter without cooking the eggs and you do that over water. And, and you don't do it over the direct heat and you get the temperature more evenly spread. And the same thing is true with cooled RF. You get the temperature instead of charring around the probe, you get it spread out more. So you get a bigger lesion, but it's still heat. It's still, you know, 80, it's still 80 degrees centigrade as opposed to cryo, which is minus 70 degrees. So two ends of the spectrum, but, but definitely much bigger lesion. Bruna has one question for you. Hi there. I want to... The cryoablation of the pudendo nerves. Uh, can I uh, have a possibly the incontin fecal incontinence in patient? So again, I always do the diagnostic injection first, and I tell the patient this is what it's going to feel like. I'm not taking pain away. I'm making it numb. Okay, so if they don't have fecal, fecal incontinence when you do the diagnostic injection, they won't when you cryo it. I do not do bilateral pudendals at the ischial spine because that takes out the whole pudendal. I will do, however, I will do the individual branches. Um, and if you're doing it bilaterally for a woman, you're gonna take out her clitoral stimulation. For guys, you're gonna take out the, um, the shaft of the penis. So it is important in my mind, I do, the diagnostic pudendal at the ischial spine, is it pudendal or not pudendal? But then I go back and I try and pick out the individual branches that are involved and then freeze only those individual branches. But if, if uh, a pergunta aqui é se uh, a crio pode causar incontinência fecal, né? Agora, a, a pergunta, André, é se fizermos isso de um lado só, a pessoa não vai ter é, incontinência. If we do cryo just on one side of the pudendal in the ischial spine, uh, is it possible to have a, a fecal incontinence or it's not a hundred percent? Pudendal is not pudendal is not the motor to the to the sphincter. So so no, it doesn't no. Um, but you may pick up other branches if you're not careful. And so that's why I just, if you're doing only one side, it won't be a problem, but I always try and go as far distal as I can. Very nice. We, we could be here all the night, all, all night long, but in respect to you, let's go to the second one. Okay. All righty.
So we're going to talk about PNS. And I didn't change what I was between now and then. Um, so peripheral nerve stimulation started in 1965 with Walls and Melzack's gate theory. And the in 19, by 1967, Wall and Sweet had been stimulating their own infraorbital nerves. So just two years after the idea of the, the gate theory. By 69, they'd come up with a cuff that would go around the nerve. And so they would dissect out the nerve and wrap it around. It was for actually CRPS. And by the 80s, this is something that Gabor Rex was really working hard for. And then they would take a, instead of the wraparound electrode, they would take a paddle electrode and dissect the nerve and lay it on there. Well, clearly that wasn't too terribly a great idea. I mean, uh, very useful for us. But Rick Weiner developed a percutaneous placement of occipital stimulators under fluoro in 1999. And the um, and then in the 18, 19, sorry, 2009, Mark Huntoon placed the first PNS under ultrasound in the occipital region. And then FDA approved um, just recently. So previously we had sort of landmark guided, it was really more of a field stimulation. Plate bleeds were placed percutaneous in the general region of the nerve, or you could do what we just talked about, the surgical dissection and wrap the electrode around the nerve, but clearly there was scarring and there was no way to really try all that. And so we also had the problem, even when we were placing them under ultrasound or fluoro, we still had to find a place to put this IPG. Now we could put it in the abdomen, the thigh, the buttocks, the anterior, the infraclavicular region. You'd have to tunnel. If you were having some a stimulation on the foot, you'd have to tunnel it all the way up to the belly. And then you had all these people with pain from the pocket of the battery. And so this battery ends up being a significant problem. And when you have a patient who's using a rechargeable battery, they get this whole big basket of stuff to do a charger, to do the recharger, to wear a belt, to charge through the skin with, with temperatures burning and pain at the pocket site. And in fact, 20% of explants were explanted due to IPG pocket pain. And um, this 43% had IPG site pain and 6% reported severe pain. And when we're talking to patients, we usually focus on the incidence of infection, but based on these findings, we should talk more about discomfort at the battery site. And I love this topic, or this title, pocket pain and neuromodulation, negligent or neglected. And again, uh, up to 8% with severe pocket pain. And so when we look at spinal cord stimulation, it's been running right around three to 8%. We, but when we talk about IP, severe IPG pain, eight out of 10, we're talking about six to 8%, at least as much as we see with infections. So standard, we wanna try and identify, are there patients that are good candidates and how can we mitigate some of these pocket pain issues? So the diagnosis is hidden in the patient's history and the cause is elicited by the physical exam. It's the history given by the patient and in the patient's own words that's key to making the diagnosis. So you need to know the mechanism of injury, initial site of the pain, and initial referral pattern. So these pain patterns are very specific for a lot of these nerves. And you have the patient point to where it hurts and then and inspect it. And based on your knowledge of the patterns of pain, you make an educated guess to the entrapment site. Now you have to remember to, to examine tangentially to the nerve. If you have a guitar string and you do this, you won't get any music. You have to go across the guitar string to make music. So you have to identify, you have to examine these nerves across their structure and then make sure you're checking back proximally. Painful nerve, non-painful nerve, painful nerve, non-painful nerve. So you're treating it. In, um, if, you, if you have painful nerve, painful nerve, painful nerve, painful nerve, non-painful nerve, and you're treating it here, you'll never get the pain under control because you won't be proximal enough. Show me where it hurts or show me where it started. Um, you look at inspection um, and then physical exam. And normal nerves are almost insensate to pain. So when you get these inflamed nerves, they're exquisitely tender. And so we have some diagnostic tests. We have an EMG nerve conduction study, but we know that's not very, um, very, sensitive. Uh, we don't usually see the cause of the pain as easily here on MRI as we do because normal uh, on this patient, because normally the nerves are very small 
um, that we're getting better at being able to do sequences of the MRI to be able to pick out those nerves. But ultrasound has really made a big difference in our ability to identify the neuroma that's here that was causing this patient's uh, phantom limb pain. And so um, then you have the diagnostic injections. And I think these are absolutely key because if you don't know where the pain's coming from, you can't possibly get it better. And the, you know, I could do the world's best appendectomy, but if the problem's your gallbladder, I'm not gonna get you any better. And so you can do landmark guided injections. Um, you can do use a peripheral nerve stimulator, CT, fluoro or ultrasound. That's not really what matters. It means it matters that you're making the right diagnosis. For those of y'all who don't do much ultrasound or who do um, sort of more anesthesia-based ultrasound, those are usually done in plane. And it's easier. You get to see the needle the whole time you're doing it. Um, but there's less contact with the nerve if you're trying to do a stimulator in that area. Maybe more difficult to interface. And it's really best for stimulating nerves that are perpendicular, where you're going perpendicular to multiple nerves, like the superior cluneal nerve. So the in-plane injection, here's your nerve. Here's your needle, the fluid going around it. And so you see it here. Um, and But if you were doing the nerve, the needle, and the stimulator, you can see that you don't have very much contact with that nerve. The outer plane, on the other hand, is technically more difficult to see the needle tip because you have to constantly be going back and forth and back and forth to make sure you're seeing the tip of the needle. And then you got to switch to the longitudinal view, but it does give you better contact with the nerve and maybe easier to secure and probably best when you're stimulating individual nerves like the posterior tibial. And so here you see the short axis in plane, but instead I'm recommending for many of these nerves, a short axis out of plane and then switching to the longitudinal view. And so it would an example would be, here's the needle tip. We're seeing this needle on end, the nerve is underneath it. And then you switch to longitudinal view. And now you can actually even see the fascial plane that you're going to try and place where you're gonna try and place the stimulator. So um, just to compare the same nerve, the posterior tibial nerve, here's the in-plane perpendicular to the nerve, here's the parallel out of plane and how much better the contact is with the nerve. So let's just talk about a couple of PNS examples. Um, suprascapular nerve is one that causes pain in the whole shoulder and forequarter. Uh, the nerve gets trapped at two places, the suprascapular notch and the sphenoglenoid notch. A physical exam, I call my Vulcan death grip. Um, you can see the suprascapular notch on MRI and you can see how easy it is to entrap it. And then that there's another branch that then comes down and goes through the sphenoglenoid notch, which is more inferior here and comes out and into the infraspinatus muscle. Landmark guided injection, fluoro guided injection, um, ultrasound guided injection. And then we place the stimulator medial to lateral right across the suprascapular notch. So the intercostal nerve um, for chest wall pain, the nerves come around and can get trapped um, anywhere along the path. And then as it enters the rectus abdominis muscle, the, landmark, the physical exam, landmark guided injection, fluoro guided injection. Remember we said this on the other one, that this is not a good direction. We wanna go obliquely instead, um, ultrasound. But here we're, we're doing the ultrasound perpendicularly, which makes it somewhat harder to do. And so instead you'd really like to do an in-plane um, injection here so that you're looking at um, passing the needle along the bottom of the rib so that then you can thread the electrode along the bottom part of the rib. And here you see a spinal cord stimulator where they were not able to get rib pain relief, but they were with a, with a stimulator, a peripheral nerve stimulator. Median nerve um, is commonly entrapped. The entrapment here, you have the nerve sitting at the top as it's coming, it's coming, been up here, it's coming down and it's gonna come on top of the quadratus here. Um, and this is probably more proximally where it's going to be entrapped more than the carpal tunnel itself and um, then the stimulator electrode 
placed in the wrist. In the anterior cutaneous entrapment or acne syndrome, these nerves come, these intercostal nerves come around and they get trapped at the edge of the rectus border and ilioinguinal iliohypogastric. We talked about that earlier. We talked about the um, nerves coming into the rectus, a physical exam, landmark guided injection, ultrasound guided injection. We talked about the cryo. Well, now here is the ilioinguinal nerve um, with the stimulator being placed across that. Superior clunial nerve. Well, you can have up to five of these superior clunial nerves. Um, you can see them under ultrasound as they cross over the top of the iliac crest. Um, lamb, I mean, fluoroscopically guided injection. And then you just lay the, the um, stimulator right across the top of the iliac crest. There's actually even a contralateral oblique approach so that you're sliding it along the top of the iliac crest if you've had problems making sure that you're not too posterior, not too anterior. So you can lay this right across the top of the iliac crest and it ends up in the same place. Middle colonial nerve we talked about a minute ago, the main innervation of the sacroiliac joint. Um, and again, talked about the nerve going through the long sacral ligament. The um, netter calls them actually middle colonial nerves. Nobody uses an anatomy book uses the lateral branches, but you can place these, stimula these stimulators lateral to the foramen, medial to the sacroiliac joint to provide relief of the middle clunial nerve, which is the nerve that goes to the sacroiliac joint, just like we treat medial branches for patients who have pathology of the facet. And for the knee, um, Philip Pang did a lovely job looking at all the various nerves that are going to the knee, but the one that gives the most pain relief for the knee is this infrapatellar saphenous nerve. And so it will give a global anterior knee pain. Um, it passes underneath the patella from the saphenous nerve. It is um, uh, misdiag misdiagnosed often as a pace serina coming across instead across the, the inferior to the, to the patella and injured by most of the surgeries done on the knee. Physical exam, landmark guided injection, fluoro guided injection. And this is why many of your quote unquote genicular RFs may fail because the nerves and there can be up to five branches are not always found in this region where you would be looking at them for fluoro, but they can be above or below or there can be multiple and so you might miss. So um, we can certainly do cryo of um, we can do cryo of all three nerves. We can stimulate all three nerves, but it's the infrapatellar saphenous um, that gives us the most. So if we're doing this under fluoro, we would do a, a seeker needle right here at the flare of the tibia um, and place the electrode right there in the flare where the nerve is crossing across there. Now look here, if you notice that this patient has lateral osteoarthritis, but we placed a medial stimulator. Why? Because when we injected the infrapatellar saphenous, all her pain went away. And then you can use this also for the post-surgical, like the total knee replacements. Um, and if need be, you can also place the stimulator cephala in the, in the superior, um, the superior anterior lateral cutaneous and the superior anterior medial cutaneous nerves. And then the posterior tibial is a, it does most of the um, bottom of the foot and the heel. It um, goes through the tarsal tunnel, often the, the branch, the mediocalcaneal branch to the heel will take off before it goes through the tarsal tunnel. And then it, it breaks into the medial plantar and the lateral plantar nerves. You can see this well under ultrasound in a live patient. And there's the characteristic, what we call the Mickey Mouse ears, vein, artery, vein, and the nerve will reliably be right under or just to the side of that. Now you don't want to be putting your stimulator in the tarsal tunnel because then there's just gonna make that space uh, even tighter. So instead we start up a little bit higher and then thread down um, toward the tarsal tunnel. And so you can do this landmark guided by dividing the space, um, the posterior aspect of the um, medial malleolus and the anterior aspect of the Achilles tendon and then divide that space in thirds and stay in the posterior one third or you can do it under fluoro or you can do it under ultrasound. Now there are a couple of different systems you can use. You can use SPR, 
which is paste placed through a 20 gauge needle designed to be removed after 60 days. And there's a stimulator. Uh, this is covered with a tegaderm and there's a stimulator that's glued to the skin. And they've done a variety of studies looking at post amputation, chronic low back, chronic shoulder um, and knee arthroscopies. It's wireless, um, no uh, IPG, no battery implant, but it's sticky pads and this bulky external case. And it only has a monopolar electrode designed to be removed after 60 days. And it can be a fragile lead and no advanced waveforms. Bioness stem router was originally used to um, lead placement for shoulder pain after strokes. Um, it's a lead and antenna and then a, a, hand, a wireless handheld controller. So you, you see the timed leads, the um, receiver that goes is glued onto the skin and then the controller. And so it goes onto the skin like that. Um, and the controller tells the, um, tells the receiver to send signals to the wire that's underneath the skin. And you can program the, um, how many uh, seconds it's on and off, but you can't change the waveforms. It's monopolar. You have to wait three weeks before impl after implant because you're placing this right over where the surgical system is. No advanced waveform, and you've got to carry that remote separately. And then we have Nalu. It's a large, uh, it's a um, implanted receiver um, with two potentially two different leads, um, either four or eight contacts. Um, this is about the size of a hockey puck and the phone app is what tells this battery what to do, the therapy disc. And so it has to be also glued on to the skin to keep it exactly over where the receiver is. Um, Stimwave, on the other hand, everything that's in a, an IPG is in this little chip, this little microcomputer chip. And that's what allows us to be able to give, put a stimulator through a needle. There's a receiver that's placed inside the electrode array and then the antenna and the, the power transmitter, which together are called a wearable antenna assembly or WA, are then placed outside the, the clothing um, or underneath your clothes um, to power that. And it's, it's using a system called uh, EFDMC or electro, uh, um, electrofrequency uh, magnetic coupling that allows us to be able to be as much as seven centimeters away from the, the um, stimulator and still be able to power the electrodes. And so you wear this um, with the power pack. This, go, this gets plugged into the, to the wall, it recharges. When the one, one is done, you just unscrew it and switch it out for a fresh one. And so we have um, the wall, but a whole variety of wearables that can be, um, that can be snapped into clothing or camisoles or belts. Um, and so its advantage is that it's full body MRI compatible, uh, no sticky pads, fabric, fabric integrated wearables with four or eight um, electrode programmability. You can use it immediately after surgery and multiple waveforms that are available. Um, the transmitter weighs about 75 pounds. And you do have to have some patience to put in that receiver. Other than that, much less cons than we see in other systems. In general, wireless PNS decreases the surgical trauma and therefore the post-op pain and potentially decreases infection. So it's a, good can it's a good choice for your smokers and diabetics. Easier to upgrade because you're doing software changes instead of hardware changes. No repeat surgeries for battery replacements. No need to tunnel to a distant pocket. Um, it is external power and recharging. And then you have to deal with either ad adhesives or wearables. So battery packet pain is a significant problem and wireless SCS and PNS obviates this pain. Where peripheral nerve stimulation has been hampered in the past by the need to tunnel to an IPG site and wireless stimulation solves these problems. And now there are a whole variety of places and pathologies that we can treat with stimulation. So the indications for stimulation are growing. It's not just spinal cord stimulation anymore. I think um, that stim waves uniquely positioned to meet this need Perhaps we should concentrate on the term neuro augmentation instead of SCS and PNS because it's better living through electricity. So, and again, I thank you. Andrea, é, primeiramente, eu, tô, eu, eu vejo que o futuro é hoje, não é? As coisas estão acontecendo e 
as possibilidades são muitas e várias tecnologias são oportunidades muito grandes, principalmente também para o anestesiologista, né, que tem dificuldade de manipular, um, fazer um acesso cirúrgico, e isso aí é bem mínimo em relação ao todo de uma cirurgia. André, a primeira pergunta em português. É, que tipo de onda que você escolhe para fazer um estímulo, por exemplo, de um nervo misto, né, um nervo mediano? Which kind of wave do you choose when you use a PNS? For uh, median nerve, for example, that it's a mix, uh, it's sensitive and motor at the same time. Do you choose the high frequency uh, steam or another one? Well, on the table, we'll do a tonic stimulation to make sure that we're getting stimulation in the right pattern. But then we found that patients are doing extraordinarily well with um, either a high density or a burst or a, um, a higher frequency. Sub, all of those are subthreshold. So um, the, we almost immediately turn it to a subthreshold stimulation and can run the power up and down, change waveforms, change polarities, um, whatever is necessary. So the, the tonic steam in, in this nerve, it's sub, uh, it didn't make movements. Doesn't make movements, doesn't feel tingling. It, and it's making our whole concept of, you know, we always said nerves can only carry one signal at a time. And if they're busy carrying a non-painful tingle, tingle, then the painful signal can't get through. I now think of it more like a dog whistle that the dog can hear, but you can't. So these nerves, are recognizing that they're being blocked, they're being blocked, having blocked signals, but it's not loud enough that the patient can feel it. They just stop feeling the pain. Tá, então, a And Andrea falou que pode usar qualquer um tipo de, de ondas que tem, né? Burst ou tônica ou alta densidade ou alta frequência e não escolher qual que é a melhor para cada paciente. Obviamente que na mesa ela faz um estímulo tônico para ver se está se no local correto. Uh, another question, it will be my last one. Uh, how often do you need to charge this, uh, this battery? Quanto, 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 quão frequente você tem que carregar esta bateria? Well, when you have a flashlight, how long does that battery last? If you have a flashlight or you have your phone, how long does that charge last? Well, it depends on how much you're using it, how much power you're using. So most patients, the, these, the, our newest batteries will hold about an 18 hour charge at full power, at, at full use. But what we're finding is that people are using it, these much more like they do a pain medicine. They stimulate until they stop hurting and then they stop stimulating. And um, because it's subthreshold, we can use much lower powers. And so we've got one guy who charges for two hours every Wednesday. I mean, he stimulates two hours every Wednesday. That's all he needs. We have other people who wear it 24 seven. And so they'll do one for the day and then they'll change batteries for the night and the other one's charging. So the next morning they just change them out. Andrea, Camila sent me a, a question to ask to you. We have three technologies. Uh, Andrea, nós temos três tecnologias. Uh, rádio frequência pulsada, trio e estimulação de nervo periférico. Uh, quando você escolhe cada um? We have three technologies. Three Which one's best? What do you use? Pulsar radio frequency. When you choose one and other, okay. your guidelines. So in the United States, we can't, we can't get reimbursed for pulsed radio frequency. So I don't use that very often. Uh, I see its role as a stunning of the nerve, a, and then leaving. And so it's a low risk, technique 
that you already have available in most practices. Um, and so I would, in your particular situation, I'd probably start there. However, you know that most patients don't get long-term relief from that. So my next then is, are, is this something that would benefit from a cryo and then rehabilitation? Or is this going to be something that's gonna likely need cryos multiple times? Is this a patient who would rather have something they control? Or is this a patient who doesn't want stuff on them? And so um, I think you have the, uh, I think of the cryo as one and done. I think of the stimulator as being longer term, continued treatment. Um, and so, um, or in a situation where there's a, a large motor component. So for instance, if you had a common, a common fibular or common perineal nerve pathology, I don't wanna cryo that, I'm gonna leave them with a foot drop but I can stimulate them without affecting the motor. Um, suprascapular nerve, I do the diagnostic injection. If I've got somebody with severe shoulder pain, even though the suprascapular nerve is a motor nerve, they get, usually get much more relief and use of the arm, even though it's technically weak because of the loss of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. I get them to try it out. If they have trouble raising their arm to brush their hair, or if they have trouble reaching overhead while they're numb from the cryo, and that's a, an important part of what they're doing, then maybe cryo isn't the right technique. Maybe a stimulator would be better. So there it is a, a judgment. The cryo is, if I've got somebody who comes from a long distance away and there's not a rep, cryo is clearly better. If I've got somebody who is, um, has to have multiple areas, say five, six, eight ribs that are involved, well, that might be better with a lateral spinal cord stimulator or pulse radio frequency of multiple levels, certainly not multiple stem wave electrodes at each level. So it's got to be very individualized. Very nice, wonderful lecture. We, we saw that uh, how important is the ultrasound working with these technologies, no? Cryo and PNS. It's it works wonderfully. Wedding, no? Yes, it's a wonderful wedding. And so one of the things I've loved about being involved in StemWave is it's been that combination of my knowledge of peripheral nerves, you know, who knew? Um, and then the adding ultrasound to that and having already treated nerves for 30 years with cryo. So I know where they are. I know the, the techniques that work and the, the, the places where we need more um, tools. And so it's just been a very nice marriage of all those technologies. Muito obrigado, André, pela sua presença aqui hoje. Eu sei que você precisa descansar, que daqui a pouco você já precisa levantar, não? E, e nós precisamos de você descansada para estar aqui no Brasil na próxima semana. Hoje <risos> não. Are you coming direct or are you going back to the US? I am going back to the U.S. for three days and then to Brazil. So. Don't do that. Come here. <laughs> Kisses. Thank you very much. I have patience waiting. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.